because we meet together we're here in his name let's ask the Holy Spirit to come down and bless this place I'm coming with a heart of worship I'm bringing in a brand new song I'm ready to see the unthinkable I'm ready for a miracle hearts praying for a fresh encounter souls looking to the living Like a fly, like a fly. 
gave his life for us. The reason we're here to worship today. Open your hearts. You gave your life for mine. Nailed to the cross. You crucified all my sin and shame. Washed by your mercy You find the treasure I find My reason for living So let my life Become an offering To the one who is worthy and all praise to the Lord all praise to the one who saved my life All praise to Jesus Christ My King of heaven, my King forever You storm the gates of my heart Fell in between, was torn apart. Now you hold the keys to the grave, cause you bring things to life. You're all stones away. All praise to the Lord Most High, and all praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ. My King of Heaven, my King forever. All praise to the Lord Most High. And all praise to the One who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of Heaven, my King forever. Can you not stand in wonder and awe of a king who came and gave himself so you and I have a way home? I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down, my whole life down before you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down. My whole life now is for you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down. My whole life down before you. I lift my hands up, lay my whole life down. My whole life now is for you.
Father God, you're a king forever. You're a sovereign king. You're a loving king. We ask you, Father, to inhabit our lives, to surround us with your arms and your hope. God, let us be vessels today. And you fill us up and get everything else out of the way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Good morning. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Hey, we are in uh, the last week of this series where we kicked off the new year just looking at uh, what Shelby Christian Church is all about, why we are here, wh why we do what we do, those kind of things. And so we've been looking through uh, three words. We've been talking about having this conversation on what it means to be people who reach lost people because our, our mission statement says Shelby Christian Church exists to reach lost people to equip fully devoted disciples or followers, and then to impact the world for Jesus. And so what we want to look at today is that third piece. The last couple of weeks, Dave has talked to us about what it looks like to reach and equip. And today we're going to talk about what it looks like to, to impact, to make a difference in our community and around the world in the name of Jesus. Here, here's what I know about every single person that will be here today, that was here Thursday night, that there are people in your life that has impacted your life, right? You, you guys know what the, the definition, you're smart people, you know what impact means. Impact's having a significant effect on someone or something, right? So a significant effect. There are people in your life, if I were to ask you to give me a list of a few people that have impacted your life positively, you could come up with that list, right? You would probably say a parent, a grandparent, a coach, a teacher, a friend, someone in your life has been a significant positive impact in your life. But I could also ask you, hey, were there people, are there people, have there been people in your life that were, were negative <laughs> impacts on your life that have done things that were hurtful or that influenced you in a way to do some things that maybe got you in trouble, right? You guys, some of you guys that are, are beyond middle school, high school, you remember back in the day when, when the, the friend or the group of friends, hey, come on, let's go do this. And you knew if you went with that group to do that, that it was not going to end in a positive way. Like there was trouble to be had around that corner, right? And so there are people in our lives that, that impact us all the time. And so when we think about and talk about what it looks like to be a community of believers, community of changed lives who impact the world for Jesus, like what, what does that look like? How does a church have a significant impact on the world? Uh, chances are that, that a lot of you, when you think about a, a big question like that, how can we make a difference? How can I, like this one person, make a difference in this world? It, it kind of seems daunting, doesn't it? And, and so here's what I, because I think a lot of people wrestle with this. What could, God, what could you do with, with me? Like, you know you, you know your inadequacies, you know your sin, you know everything that you carry around and that, that is you, right? And so it's like, God, how, would, how could you use me to make a, a significant difference in this world for you. And, and today, here, here's what I want to do. I want to help all of us see ourselves the way Jesus sees us. That's, that's the goal of today. I want you to see yourself the, the way that, that God sees you because he sees you in a way that, that is, is powerful and that you can make a difference. You, you may have no idea how one conversation 
right? One simple act of, of kindness, one just opportunity for you to just to stop for a moment and express love might change someone else's life. There is, there, chances are that there have been people in your life that have come along at a, at a specific time, they said something, they did something, they were there in the right moment, right? It seemed like this God-ordained thing that happened in your life that you needed in that moment. Like you were struggling. You just, you just needed a little encouragement. You needed a little love. You needed a little kindness. You needed a boost. You needed someone to come along and pat you on the back and tell you it's going to be okay. Like you needed something. And, and at some point, maybe God sent someone into your path, and it was like, man, I needed that today. I needed that word. I needed to have that conversation. I needed just to, to, have, to see that look, see that smile, right? Chances are you've, you've experienced that in your life, and, and God wants to use you to do the same in other people's life, that and, and so much more. And so three words we talked about before, reach, equip, impact. We're going to talk about three more words in this sermon. Three words that start with the letter I. The first one's invest. The second one's influence. And then we're going to finish with what it looks like to make an impact. Let's, let's talk about invest first, investing in people. How do we invest in people? Let me, let me suggest a, a couple of things for you guys today. The first thing I think we need to do is I think we need to be intentional in our relationships. We need to be intentional in the relationships that we have with other people. When you look at the life of Jesus, you'll notice that he was very intentional in the way that, that he set up his, his, his group, his, his friend group, right? He went out and he found 12 men that he knew could, could walk along with him, were, were ready to go with him. And he said, hey, come follow me. Let's go. I've got, I've got something for you. And so he picked 12 guys. Beyond that 12 guys, Jesus had a, a smaller group uh, that's been called before the, the, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Three, three really close friends. You guys probably have, most of you guys probably have a friend group, like a large group of people that you get together at birthday parties for your kids, or like you'll have a Super Bowl party and invite them over in a couple of weeks or whatever. Like you have this big friend group maybe, and then you have, it's maybe people you work with or people in your family or whatever. You have a, a larger group of people that you would consider these are my friends. Then you probably have a, a closer, like smaller group of people that you're really close friends. And then for a lot of people, you may have a best friend, someone you would say, this is my best friend. Jesus had, had John. And so Jesus was very intentional in the way that he set up his relationships with other people. He ministered to a large audience of people on a regular basis, but he had a small group of people that he was really intentional with. And so what I want to encourage you guys with to, to, today is to be intentional with, with some people, some people that you may be in relationship with, because Jesus understood this, that there was going to be this exponential impact, right? This ripple effect that would take place. When Jesus poured himself into those 12 men, he knew that they would go out and they would pour themselves into another group of people and another group of people and another group, one person at a time, right? So, so when you think about the, the roots of Christianity that started with Jesus intentionally investing in 12 guys, that today there are 2.6 billion Christians on the earth. Now, there's eight, almost 8 billion people on the earth, so there's still a lot of work to be done. But it started with a group of men who Jesus identified and said, I'm going to spend time intentionally with these guys. There, there's 5.4 billion, if you do the math there, right? So if there's 2.6 billion, there's about 5.4 billion people who aren't followers of Jesus yet. And you look at that and you go, wow, how, how could we possibly, how could anyone make a dent in, in that, right? It, it seems like so, such a significant number. How could one person make a difference in a big group of people like that, billions and billions of people who, are, who don't know the Lord. Here's, here's what we know. We know that, that we can't individually, but, but what we can do is we can be very intentional with one person. That's why we talk about who's your one, right? We're going to continue to ask that question, ask you guys that question, and, and, and hopefully you can right off the top of your head say, here's the person or the people that I'm being intentional with in my life, that I know that God's placed in my life for a very specific reason. Here, here's what I want you to understand when we talk about being intentional and, and who's your one and, and the way that you, go, you guys go about your daily life. Here, here's, here's what you need to understand. Tomorrow morning when you get up, you go to work, if you're a student, you go to school, it, it, wherever you go, 
this week, whatever, whatever Monday has for you tomorrow morning, when you get up and leave your home, the, the, if you are a follower of Christ, if you were to say today, yes, I, I am a follower of Jesus, he's my Lord and Savior, and I am following in Jesus' ways. And if that's you, then here's what you need to understand. There, there is something that, that Jesus has for you that's beyond just going to work and earning a paycheck for your family. If you're a student, there's something far more important that you're gonna do tomorrow. If you're a student who is a follower of Jesus, there's something far more important you're gonna do tomorrow than just going to algebra class or going to practice after after school or whatever you're gonna do this week. The number one thing that you need to understand that is before you, that is your mission, is that you need to go on behalf of Jesus, who has called you out, right, into this new wonderful life. And now you, the Bible calls us ambassadors. He calls us people who are now on a mission, who go before, and and we, as we put on the name of Christ, right, we are his representatives. And your primary objective, if you are a follower of Jesus, is to go into this community, go to your place of work, to go to your school, to go to the grocery store, to go into your neighborhood, wherever you may go this week, and to be that person for Jesus. And so we need to be intentional in our relationship and understand what that looks like. That's what we're gonna talk about a little bit more this this morning. The second thing we need to do is we need to slow down and take notice of other people. I wanna show you a passage of scripture that's really powerful. Look at this, this is in Matthew chapter chapter 20. It says this, as Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind them, two blind men, were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd said, be quiet. You guys shut up, right? Get out of the way. You're a nuisance. We we get it. You're blind. You can't see. Go stand on the side. But they only shouted louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, he stopped. He stops and he called, what do, you, what do you want me to do for you? I, I picture, here's how I picture this happening. Don't know because I wasn't there. But I picture this Jesus walking up to these men and kind of grabbing their hands because obviously they can't see him in front of them. And like just grabbing their hands. And like not, not, in, a, not in a way of like being um, annoyed that these men are slowing him down. But, but like looking, looking into their face, right? Holding their hands. What, what can I do? What, what, do, you, what do you need What do you need from me? How can I help you? And they said, Lord, we want to see. And Jesus felt sorry for them. And he touched their eyes. And instantly they could see. Now imagine, this is hard because um, we we all can can see, right? And so it's hard. Most of it, like, you you can see, like, Images and colors and, 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 and all this stuff. Think of all the stuff that you've seen. A sunset, the ocean, your loved ones, all the stuff. Everything that you've... And so imagine never being able to see any of that, right? See anything. And Jesus comes along and they know that Jesus... They've heard tell of who this guy is. And they, they believe that he can, he can do something about their situation. And they say, we just want to see. And so Jesus touches their eyes, and instantly they can see their life, their lives are changed right there in that moment as they're standing there on that road in Jericho, right? And you look at this story and go, wow, that's that's incredible. Like, that's the point of this whole story, that Jesus comes along, and he touches these guys, and now they can see. What what a great story. But here's what I don't want you not to miss, right? I want you to miss, don't miss this last part. Here's what's important. Here's Here's the investment that Jesus made by stopping long enough to hear part of someone's story, and, and then he, he invests some time, and he knows he can help, and then here's, here's the eternal impact. Here's the eternal investment that's made. Then, what did they do? They followed him. They got up. Now they're able to see, and, and they realize, all right, I don't know where this guy's going. I don't exactly know what he's all about. I don't know, I don't know all of this. I don't understand this Jesus completely, but I know I want to follow him. I want to go where he's going. And so they get up and they become followers of Jesus. Here's here's this beautiful picture of of Jesus stopping long enough to hear someone else's story and saying, "I, I think I can help. Maybe for us, 
maybe we just need to stop long enough. Maybe, maybe you just need to stop long enough because we get so busy. And we're so running from place to place to thing to appointment to this with work and kids and and all this stuff, right? We're always busy. And and there are people that you bypass every single day that are blind. They they may not be physically blind, but they're spiritually blind. And and they, they need to know about the Savior that you know. They need to know about the one that can change their circumstances. And so maybe for us, we need to be intentional and we need, need to slow down long enough to understand what God has in front of us. Invest. Invest in the lives of others. That's the first I word. Here's the second one. Influence. I get the definition of influence. Influence is this. You guys know this. The capacity to have a significant effect on the character development or behavior of someone or something. You guys know that there are now, there's a term that's called social media influencers. You guys heard this? And so here's what's happened, is that uh, social media companies and famous people have realized that there's millions and billions of dollars to be made off of, off of us. All they have to do is partner with each other and and have this significant influence on social media and and they can make all kinds of money. You guys realize that like if you're if you use Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all those all those social media apps, those things aren't the product. You realize what the product is? It's us. (laughs) Like we're the product. Right? They know that if they can get a big following, if they, can, if they can get a bunch of people to follow these things, then if they can get a, a famous person to come along and they can put them on their app and they say, hey, you should wear the, the clothes that so-and-so wears, or you should drink this energy drink that so-and-so drinks, or you should wear these shoes that so-and-so wears, right? And so there's this influence. And I, I looked at a list, I look at this list of, of kind of social media influencers. This is the top 50, um, of a list of the top 50 influencers. You guys may, it may be hard to see, but there's some of them here. Like the number one social media influencer, this is maybe, maybe isn't like a little older, a year old or so, it was Cristiano Ronaldo. Do you guys, you might, does, how many people know who Ronaldo, Ronaldo, Ronaldo is, right? All right? So a few soccer guys, right? The, the most famous soccer player in the world. He has over, at this point, he had over 517 million followers on, on all the social media apps. There's Justin Bieber on there, Ariana Grande, Selena Gomez, Taylor Swift, any Swifties in the room? Right? Okay. So, wow. Uh, so, so all these famous, The Rock, Katy Perry, right? All these people. And if you look at these numbers and you look at these people and you go, if, if that is what influence is, right? Well, then we can, we can never measure up, right? We're never going to, we're never going to measure up to, to someone who has all these quote unquote followers, all this influence in the world and all this money. And so when, you, when we think about influence, it's, it's, it's hard for us to think past something like that. But here's what I want you to see. I want you to understand that, that, that having influence in the way that Jesus sees you and me is different. It's significant, and it's an influence that only we as followers of his can have. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is his Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus looked at the people that were there that day, and he said this to them. Those who were following after him, he said, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. But Jesus looks at the people, he looks at us, and he says, You, you are the salt of of the earth. Now we understand what salt does, right? Salt changes things. When salt is introduced into a recipe, when it's, when it's on the scene, salt changes things. We use salt to flavor food. We use it to preserve meat, right? We use it to melt ice on the roads, right? Changes in our last couple of weeks. You had a bunch of salt on your car. You either went to the car wash and had it washed off or you let the rain do it or whatever, right? But you have all this salt. And so we use salt for all different kinds of things. Uh, or Melinda reminded me of a, a, a story, a salt story we, that I have from a few a few years ago, we went to a restaurant in Louisville, Middletown. We went to Wick's Pizza one night, and we sit down to, to it's not there anymore. We went, we went there, and we were uh, order order our pizza, order a, a sweet tea, and the waiter brought uh, my cup of you know sweet tea to the table, and put my straw in, and I'm getting I drank this big gulp of what I was expecting to be sweet tea, and it was the most horrible experience of my life. 
because somebody, he had, he had mistakenly uh, put salt and not sugar in the sweet tea. And so it was like, you know, when you go to the ocean and you get a big gulp of like the sea, uh, ocean water, it was like, I thought I was going to die. And I'm spitting up and choking. And Melinda's like, what is wrong with you? And it's like, it's like gross, but it's also funny. And I, and I call the guy over and I'm like, hey, dude, I think you put salt. I, I don't think I know you put salt and not sugar in, in this tea, right? He's like, oh, you know, so he obviously got the two containers confused in the back. And I was like, I don't know if somebody played a joke on you or what, dude, but whatever. And so, so when, but when salt is present, it's like, whoa, right? You know it's there. It's this thing. And so when Jesus says to us, you are the salt of the earth, what he's saying is, is that you are a change agent. You're an agent of change. And when you're added to a situation, you have this significant influence, or at least you should, right? When, when you enter in, into a situation, a conversation, a room, a, a, a new environment, like as, as a Believer, as an ambassador, as a follower, as someone who has put on the name of Christ, you should make a difference. It should be obvious. Jesus goes on and he uses another example. He says this. He says, you are the light of the world. This passage is out on the, on the wall. When you go down the steps over in the kids area, you'll see this on the wall above you. It says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all people to see so that everyone will praise you. So that everyone will give you a pat on the back. So that everyone will think you're a good guy. Right? No, it doesn't say that. It says, so everyone will praise your heavenly Father. And so what Jesus says is that you, you are light. If you are a follower of mine, you carry this light. It's not a light that, that you are the source of, but you are this conduit. You are this reflection of the heavenly Father, and that light should shine through you into the dark places of this world. Would you guys agree with me that when we leave here, we go into a dark world? We go into a dark place, and it's dark, and it's dangerous, and it's nasty and it's like and there are horrible things that happen and Jesus says you're going to go into that world and what I'm calling you to do is to be light in the darkness you ever been in a totally black room you can't see your hand in front of your face and if someone were to light a match it's like whoa it illuminates the whole room right there's this significant when it's totally black a small flicker of light can be significant and so what Jesus is saying is that you are significant your influence over the darkness is significant so use it be salty and be shiny use the influence that you've been given it's not yours but it comes from Jesus. He says, now that you are following me, this is what you are to do. You are to have a significant, a significant influence in this world. And if you're not making a difference, you're not doing what he's called you to do. And so that's what it looks like. You may have no idea. You, you may have no idea how God might use you in one moment, with one conversation, right, to plant a seed that will, will grow into real and lasting influence in the life of, of someone else. One, one encouraging word, one expression of love might change someone else's life. And how many opportunities do we let pass by, right? How many opportunities do we miss because we don't realize how Jesus sees us? He, he, he sees you as, as very significant. He sees you as vital. As a part of his church, as a follower of his, he has called us out of the darkness. You have been called out of the darkness into the light, and you are to carry that. You are to be an, an influencer in this world, in this community. And so my question, one of the questions, is are, are, you, are you doing that? Are you investing in other people's lives? And are, are you being an influencer for him? And, and so those are the first two our words. Invest and influence. Let, let me share with you the third one. Impact, right? Impact people for eternity. I'm going to share with you guys John chapter 4. It records one of my all-time favorite stories in the New Testament. It's the story of the most unlikely influencer. The most unlikely influencer, I believe, in all the New Testament. Here, here's what's happening. Let me set it up for you a little bit. Jesus and his disciples are walking from Judea to Galilee. Okay, and so to kind of understand the walk, 
it would be like from, from here in Shelbyville walking to Richmond, okay? About 65, 66, 67, you know, a, a little under 70 miles. So how long would it take to walk, you know, not, not do like a marathon or running or jogging, but like to walk that far? It, it's probably going to take a few days, right? It's maybe, maybe even up to a week because you stop after 10 or 12 miles, you rest, you eat, you spend the night, you get up the next day. So, so Jesus and his disciples are on this journey that's taken them a few days. They got to go through Samaria, the Bible says. And so they get to this place along their journey. They get to this well. And it's it's, you know, it's halfway through the journey. It's hot. You know, it's the desert, the sun. You guys remember what the sun looked like? It's hard to remember. We haven't seen it, it feels like, in forever, right? But the sun's out, and it's hot. And, and Jesus decides to stop at this well, Jacob's well. And he stops, and he sits down. He, he's, he's human, so he's, you know, he's, he's exhausted, and it's, it's dusty. And he wants, he, he'd love to have a drink from this well. And so he stops and kind of just sits there next to the well. The Bible, the, John 4 says that the, other, the disciples decide they're going to go on into town to buy some food to bring it back to the group. And so Jesus is left there by himself. And this woman walks to the well. She, she walks out to the well, and, and there's this conversation that starts to take place. This Samaritan woman comes to the well to draw water, and she sees Jesus there, and Jesus asks her for a, for a drink because he's thirsty, and it's hot, and he's tired. And, and this simple request, when we read this, it wouldn't, wouldn't mean much. It's like, okay, well, this lady's got, she's prepared to get water out of the well, and Jesus asks for a drink. Not a big deal, right? But here's what we need to understand is that Samaritan people and Jewish people did not associate. In fact, Jews hated Samaritans. They, they thought they were uh, less than human. They thought they were less than dogs. They called them half-breeds. They, 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 they thought they were, they were horrible people. And so Jewish people and Samaritans did, did not, and, and there, was, there was, under no circumstances, was a Jewish man ever going to talk to a Samaritan woman. That just did not Happen, And so when Jesus is there sitting at this well, and this woman walks up, and, and Jesus starts to have a conversation with her, she's, she's startled, she's confused, she has no idea what's going on. And I want you to, I want you to see what happens in the rest of the story. In, in John chapter 4, verse 9, it says this, The woman was surprised, right, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to, to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? The next slide, there you go. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, if you only knew, right? If you only knew who, who, you're, who you're having a conversation with, who, whose presence you are standing in front of. Maybe, maybe for some of, of us today, maybe for you this morning, you just need to be reminded of whose you are and, and, and whose presence you stand in the midst of, right? Sometimes we forget whose we are and who we are. And he says, if you only knew what God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give it, I would give you living water, Jesus says. But sir, you, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you, where would you get this living water? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give you will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And, and then look next. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll go, and I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to ever come back here to get water again. Now, hold on to that, because that's, that's a significant phrase. She's like, you, you're, you want to give me water, and I'll never have to come back here again? I'm all in. Let, let's talk more about this water. And, and then look at what happens next. There we go. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth, sir, the woman said. You must be a prophet. And so here's this encounter, right? Here's this encounter that this woman is having with Jesus, the Messiah. 
and, and he's talking about water, and she's talking about water, and never having to come back to this well again, and that sounds wonderful to her, and then Jesus kind of goes in a different direction, right? He starts getting personal. And here's what Jesus knew about this lady that came to the well that day. Jesus knew that this woman was shunned in her own community. He knew that, that other people, other women, whispered about her behind her back, hey, do not, do not let your husband, by no, under no circumstances, let your husband talk to that lady. Don't let your, don't let your husband ever be around that lady, right? Th that lady will wreck your marriage, she'll wreck your home, stay away from that lady. She was, she was an outcast. Uh, other, other people in the village ignored her and avoided her. Jesus knew that this woman was, was broken and that she had one broken relationship, right? Right after another. One relationship after another, after another. She's a, she's a broken, distraught, beaten down, hopeless individual that comes to the well that day. Jesus knew, he knew that she came to the well. He knew that she came to the well at noontime to avoid all the, all the drama. Because think about it. If you're a woman in that village and you, you have uh, things that you need to do in the home that day, you need to cook and you need to clean and you need all this stuff and you need water, right? And when would you go get your water? You'd go get it in the morning before, before your day began. And chances are, if you knew it was going to be really hot that day, you'd get up really early, maybe before the sun even comes up, you'd go out to the well, you'd get your water, you'd go back home, and you would carry on with the rest of your day, right? And so a lot of the women would go to the well early in the morning, and as they're out there at the well, waiting their turn to get their water, they're just standing around talking. And this woman had, had made the mistake in the past to go to the well early in the morning. And, and, and she, it was not good because she, she was, you know, they were snarling at her and they were talking about her and they were being mean to her and, and all these vicious, you know, I know it's hard for us to imagine, but, but women would never be uh, nasty to one another. We know that, right? It would never happen in our, I know it would never happen anywhere in our community, right? But these women are being nasty to this lady. And so she's like, you know what? I, I'm not going to go. I, I, you guys can save the drama for your mama. I'm going to go later on in the day, right? And so she goes at lunchtime. And Jesus knows this. He knows she's avoiding everyone else. And it's the, the hot part of the day. And he has this encounter with her. He knew her story. And he knew that she was broken. And here's what Jesus didn't do. He didn't look at this lady, this immoral woman. He didn't look at her like, like everyone else did. Here's how he saw her. He saw her as a miracle waiting to happen. Right? What, what Jesus knew was that this woman, if she could just get a touch from heaven, right, that, that things would be totally different in her life. If she could just have this one encounter with him, like, like things are going to be totally different going forward. And, and so I want you to look at how the, the rest of the story goes. Here's what happens in the next verse. It says, the, the woman says this, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he's going to explain, explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her this. He said, I am the Messiah. The, the woman left her water jar beside the well, and she ran back to the village, right? Telling everyone, she's had this, she's had this encounter. She's had, this, she's had a face-to-face -face meeting with someone that she thinks maybe potentially could be the Messiah. Like he did know these very significant things about me that, that he shouldn't have known. How did he know about my husband's? How did he know about my current situation? Like that, he, 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 there, there's something odd going on here. And then he says he's the Messiah. And, and she forgets about her water jars. And it's the Bible says she runs back in to the village. And she says this to everyone that she can find, everyone that she can see, everyone in the, in the, in the village that does not want to talk to her, that, that avoids her, that, that, that despises her. That when they see her walking, they walk the other way, right? And, and she says, you got to come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? And so the people came streaming from the village to see them, see him. This woman now has this come and see story, right? Will you come? Will you come and see? Will you come and see what I think 
I may have found the Messiah. Here's a couple of things that are really powerful in this story. The first thing is you need to understand that you are never too far gone. You're never too far gone for Jesus to pursue you. It doesn't matter what, where, who, when. It doesn't matter. Jesus is still pursuing the lost. And it didn't matter what this woman's past was like. It didn't matter what her current circumstances were. Jesus knew, I'm going to get this opportunity right here in front of her. And this today, for this lady, things are going to be different from here on out, right? And, and so he, he has this encounter with her. She has this incredible, impactful encounter. The second thing you need to understand is the town outcast is the one who would tell everyone who would listen about this Messiah, right? Come and see the one who I think, I, th I think this is the guy. You guys got to come check this out. Will you come back with me, right? And so you don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to have it all figured out. We're, we're broken people. He uses broken vessels, messed up people, right? He uses them every single day. He's using one right now, right? He uses us. He uses you. He wants to use you. And so if you have this come and see attitude, there are two things you need, right? You, you, need, to, you need to have this encounter with Jesus. This is all you need. You need to have, if you want to make an, an, an impact for eternity in someone else's life, here's the two things. You, you got you to gotta have an encounter with Jesus that leads to a relationship. When was it that Jesus came into your life and wrecked it? Turned it upside down. You thought you were going to go do this, and you thought life was going to be this way, and you thought, you thought your life was going to be this, and then you had an encounter with Jesus, and it totally flipped it upside down, right? And now you've got to come and see story. You got, i got to tell you about what Jesus did in my life. And now that led to a relationship. And so when you have an encounter that leads to a relationship, and then you pair that with someone who's passionately pursuing others and, and encouraging others to come and see right? Hell will not prevail against that. Hell will not prevail against a person who has a come and see story to tell this world. And this lady had that kind of story. And so here's what I want to ask you. Do you have that kind of a story? Do you know him? Do you know him? Have you had an encounter with him that's changed your life? And are you, are, do you have this passionate, urgent understanding of what God, how Jesus sees you? And he wants you to impact this world for him. That's what this is all about. And so do you know him? Can you lead others to this living well? Here's the thing you need to understand. You can't lead someone. You can't lead someone to a place you've never been yourself. We can't lead someone. And so this lady, she'd been at the well. She had this conversation. She knew he was there. She goes back and says, you guys got to come check this out. I know the way to the Messiah. Will you just follow me? Let's go back out here and check this out. And so do you know your way back to the Messiah? Do you know your way back to this living well? Can you bring other people and show them the way to the Lord? Look at how this story ends. Many Samaritans from the church believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, and so he stayed for two more days, long enough for many more to hear him and his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. Not because your grandma made you come to church when you were 10 years old. Not because your parents dragged you to church when you were in middle school or high school. Not because your wife kept nagging you to come to church. Not, not because of what someone else had said or done. But now we, we believe because we have seen him. We've encountered him. We understand that he is the savior of the world. And here's, think about this guys. There are people in heaven today. There are people in heaven this very moment because of this lady in this village in Samaria who simply went back into her town and said, you guys, I, I think this is the one. Come and check this out. He, he's the Messiah. He must be the Messiah. And so do you know your way? Do you know your way to the Messiah? Do you know your way to this living well that Jesus provides? And so for us, we need to invest in people, number one. 
Be intentional and slow down. Number two, and influence people to follow Jesus. Be salty and be shiny. And number three, impact people for eternity. Understand that you have a come and see story. Uh, here, here's the, the sermon in a sentence. Someone once told me, if you can't boil your sermon down to one sentence, it's not a very good sermon. I want you guys to look at this last, last thing. It says this, when the church invests in people and uses its influence in relationships, people are impacted for eternity. And so Shelby Christian Church exists to reach lost people, to equip fully devoted followers and disciples, and then to impact this world for Jesus. We do that collectively, but man, we do that individually. You have something that he has placed on you. If you are a follower of his, when you leave this place, you, you are called to impact this world for Jesus. Would you guys pray with me? God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have in this place this morning to gather, to sing, to worship, to take some, some time here in a, in a moment to, to spend time in communion, to reflect, to be mindful of, of who, who we are, who you've called us to be, how you see us, your church. God, sometimes we... We don't see ourselves that way. But God, we know how you see us. We can't imagine you using us, broken, messed up people, to do anything of, of, of the significance in this world. But that's exactly what your plan is, to use us. So may we be salt. May we be light in this world. Use us. Use us to influence others for your sake so that they can come and see and experience a man who changed all of it for us. God, you're telling stories. You're weaving stories together. There are stories that are represented in this room right now of how you have changed people's lives. And you tell us, don't keep that to yourself. You go share that. You go share that with a lost, broken, dying, dark world. And so, God, we understand the assignment. We understand our mission. We understand what you've called us to. We are not worthy, but because you live inside of us, you redeem us and you make us worthy. Help us, God, to be that kind of a church in this community and around the world. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you guys stand up? We're, we're going to move. You guys are welcome to move here in a second up to get your communion. If you want to give your tithes and offerings, you're free to do that. If you want to come and pray at the foot of the cross, uh, Bobby, I'll be over here at the, the baptistry if you want to pray or have something you want to talk about. We'd love to do that. Uh, let, let's move and get our communion. And you guys come back to your seats and we'll, we'll take communion together. the 
gates of my heart The veil in between was torn apart Now you hold the keys to the grave Cause you bring things to life You roll stones away think about those 12 men that um, Jesus invested in, those 12 disciples, I, I always think about one of those relationships that was, was different than the other ones, right? The relationship that, that Jesus had with Judas was an interesting relationship. You, you think about Judas, who would betray Jesus. And Jesus knew this. He knew what Judas was going to do. He knew what Jesus was about. He knew, he knew what was in Judas's heart, ultimately, that it was greedy, right? And yet he treated Judas the same way he treated the rest of his friends and his followers. He loved them. He had compassion for them. He had patience with them. He showed them grace and mercy. And he did that for Judas, even though when he looked into Judas's eyes, he knew that he would stab him in the back. Could you love someone that you knew was going to betray you? <laughs> I think about Judas and go, man, that guy was a kind of a, he was a bad dude, wasn't he? And then I think about my own life. And I think about my own sin. And, and, and I think about a God who knew exactly what I would do. And he knew exactly what would be in my heart. And yet he loves me. And he's patient with me. And he's merciful with me. And so when I look at the cross, I'm so thankful for a God who loves us in spite of us, who would do what he did, a God who would send his son to a cross that he knew would be brutal and horrible and grotesque. He knew exactly what he was doing. When he sent Jesus on our behalf. And so when we take communion, we are mindful of a body that was broken and blood that was shed. Judas was so close. He, he, it had to break Jesus' heart to know that he's so close to eternity. He was right there on the precipice. He was right there on the very edge of it. And he, he gave it all up for, for financial gain. And he walked away from it. I, I'm thankful for, for all of us who realize that, that we have a Savior that's taken care of, of everything, and we're mindful of what he's done on the cross for us. So let's take this, this bread that represents his body and this juice that represents his blood. There's one more thing I want you guys to, uh, to watch uh, before we get out of here uh, this morning. This is a, it's about a one-minute uh, video. It's a conversation uh, that Michael McLaughlin and uh, one of our friends over at uh, East Middle School, Josh Rhodes, who's the principal over there, they had a conversation last week about, about what it looks like to invest and influence uh, young people. And so I want you guys to, to hear a part of this conversation, and I'll tell you uh, how, it's, how it's relevant uh, to us as we leave here today. Watch this real quick. And we, we currently have 15 students in our Friday morning uh, program, as it were, 15 students that uh, we meet collectively to start, then we go into smaller groups of two and three uh, students with each mentor. I'd like I said, it's 15. Um, from your perspective, if you had your druthers, so to speak, how many, how many students would you like to have, or how many mentors would you like to have? 
Yeah, good question. We, we have about 560 students at East right now, so I'd like to see 560. I don't know if that's uh, logistically possible at this, at this point in 2024, but I, in all sincerity, to have um, our students have one trusted adult in their life, whether that's somebody at home, whether it's somebody at school, or it's a mentor coming in from the community, or somebody at church, um, or, or in any facet of life, it's important for each, each kid to connect with one person. And as a principal, it can be anybody for me. And so to have, have you know, the mentors come in from the community and be that consistent person um, and help them through whatever they might be going through at school or at home um, has, been a, has been a huge lift for us. So, um, you know, 560 would, would be amazing, Michael. No pressure. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, no pressure whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. So the conversation about what it would look like for us to continue to invest uh, in our middle schools, in our high schools here with mentors. And, and you, you may have heard Josh say there, that they have over 500 students uh, at East Middle. He would love for every one of them to have someone, an adult. Here, here's, here's what you guys need to understand. Our schools, our local schools, they're begging us. They're begging us to come in. I used to hear this thing where people would say, oh, look, they, they pushed God out of the school. They are begging us. We, we just need people. We, we need people who will invest in young people, middle school students and high school students. And I get it for a lot of people, this is like stepping way out of your comfort zone. Like you haven't been in a middle school or a high school maybe in a long time. You're like, I don't wanna, I remember middle school, I don't wanna go back. I get it. But there are kids that are broken and, and, and they're lost. And, and Josh Rhodes is, the principal saying, we, if you'll come, we will pair you with a student. And what they do, guys, oh, on Friday mornings, they go in the cafeteria, and they sit and they have juice and donuts, and they just talk to these students. They just love on these students. It's fun. It's an interactive thing. And, and, and we're going to do some training uh, for folks who say, I want to I wanna maybe think about this, but I don't really feel equipped. So we're going to start having some trainings on Thursday nights here. And so here's what, as you guys leave today, here's what I need you to know. Out in the lobby, Michael McLaughlin's out there, and he can share with you everything you need to, uh, every, every question you might have about what it looks like to mentor uh, with our school system. And then Scott Bean is out there too. And Scott is going to start leading uh, these uh, classes on Thursday night. They last for about an hour and a half, two hours. And it's just going to help pe equip people. Uh, to, to know what it looks like to have, a, have some tools in your bag so that if you're ready to go into these schools, like how, how to have these conversations, what to talk about, what maybe not to talk about, how, how to interact with students in middle school and high school. We want to we see programs like this. If we started at East Middle, we want to see it at West. We want to see it at MCM. We want to see it at Cornerstone. We want to see it at our high schools. We think we're going to already have something going on in the fall at Shelby County High School. And so here's what we need. We're, we're getting the program and the, and the relationship with the schools all laid out. We just need people. We need mentors. We need people who invest and influence and impact this community for Jesus. And that's you guys, all right? So thank you guys uh, for being here today. Uh, let's get out of here. Let's go love God and love people and watch them change the world. You guys go out there and talk to Michael and Scott before you leave today if you're interested in that. Thanks.